only goes in a certain way. Oh, Joe! Oh, look! It's gonna go in like that, sort of. So last you saw, I built the um, bunk top here, and then I had to talk about making the things that supported the bunks. Uh, this week we'll sort of look at these supports and how I built them. So coming up, I'll go into full detail of how I built these things, but instead of boring the pants off of everyone, I'll just talk about the finished product. So it's, it's a pretty simple thing. These are dividers for what will hopefully be where our um, socks and undies and t-shirts and stuff go. Um, the intention is that it'll be like a rock out, pull out type drawer system, uh, two of those. But of course we need some sort of backbone structure to attach all that to. And that's what these three little tiny bulkheady type things or frames are. These serve two purposes holding that but they also made this bunk thing super strong so now chin ups <laughs> makes it really really stiff and rigid so it makes our very very lightweight um, bed panel now also very stiff so how we keep everything light is by putting in strategic bits of structure so one of the biggest philosophy changes we've probably made to the boat is that all of this internal furniture now becomes structural um, so you can see just as simple as that this bunk has become stiffened by little tiny drawer bits of structure these also stiffen the um, hull side panels you've got to be a little bit careful because these stiffeners if you try to make these too stiff and too rigid they will then carry too much load and the chances of this copping a big wave here, pushing the side out and popping the bottoms off these becomes uh, a bit of a real problem. So we've got to be careful that we don't make this too stiff here, that this has still got a little bit of flex so that when this pushes in, it rotates and this will flex a little bit. So you've got to have things talking to things and working together, so yes. Everything makes everything stiffer and stronger, but you've got to be careful you don't make something too strong or too stiff and it becomes a problem. So we'll go into depth about making these little tiny frames. I've made uh, return flanges glued in under here. So here's the um, return flange. We talked about building in flanges into bulkheads and things like that. So here's a classic example of I built the uh, bulkhead with a return flange on it and you can see it's glued to the bunk top so I didn't actually have to tape it but I just pushed this up into place and it was bonded and then all this was coved and taped in. You can also see where my penetrations through the bulkhead now line up with these penetrations here uh, where these fluid lines will go. So they're now taken out of the bilges, run into areas which are very easily openable accessible and serviceable uh, big big thing for me with boats is accessibility to systems our boat is actually light, laid out pretty simply but we'll make it even simpler and easier to access these were all cut coved taped into place nothing's done quickly or shortcutedly um, so these are actually put in better than most production boat bulkheads are being put in. <laughs> so they're all structurally bonded in, coved, taped, all the rest of it, even around these penetrations. So these were 3D printed. Uh, I left the 3D printed insert in here. So our hoses will actually sit on a plastic radius edge so that there's no hard corners to wear through hoses and things like that. These are all bonded and laminated in so that, you know, they're part of it now. So hopefully in 30 years time, they'll still be there. Not much to say other than they're stupidly light, very lightweight skin on each side of the um, 10 mil foam, 300 gram. So not much there, but again, these are for holding the bunk in place and for holding our socks and undies. So it doesn't need to be much more than that. Um, and even then, it's 
pretty freaking rigid. All right. Well, let's show the footage of you debagging it and having a good look at. Yeah. So. What's all about. Huge warning. Um, there is a lot of technical, boring vacuum bagging stuff coming up next. So those that aren't into the technical side of things, bye. And those that are into the technical side, it's plenty, plenty to chew on. So you saw the uh, bunk. These are the um, dividers that will make up um, the cabinets to hold our our undies and um, t-shirts and stuff like that so they were built with return flanges uh, thickness and all the rest and to make sure everything's flat I've made it on my makeshift um, flat table again I vacuum bagged it because I don't have a vacuum gauge and I've been guessing a bit I may have boiled this one again because I talked about boiling polyester in a couple of videos ago. Let's have a quick little look here. Oh, so I've made a return flange on these bulkheads uh, with this little upstand. And we can see, uh, yeah, I sort of boiled it. But yeah, so I need to get myself a, oh yeah, appear to have boiled it. So I need to get myself a vacuum gauge um, so if I can so that I stop boiling it because I actually make bags that seal. <laughs> it's, it's normally the other way. You're always struggling to um, get your bag to seal and you don't get it to seal well enough and you don't boil it. But I've made a decent table and I'm making decent bags and uh, getting good vacuums. So I'm boiling the, the polyester resin a little bit. Not a huge issue because there is, these are all non-structural parts. So I'm not stressed at all. Um, but yeah, so uh, I guess we'll go through pulling all of this apart and show them where they go and how they glue in and what we're going to do for um, some sort of cabinetry. So it's very difficult to see on the foam bit because I actually filled all the cells of this foam because it was quite coarse foam with a um, micro bubbles or micro balloon um, microspheres uh, blended bog type thing. So it's a lightweight bond between the foam and the resin, um, between the foam and the glass. Um, where it's monolithic here, you can see just where the fibers are. The fibers are just a little bit white. It's not completely transparent here. Should be a little more transparent. You can see all this sort of whiteness in it. And that's all the little tiny, tiny, tiny micro bubbles collecting between the e-glass strands um, and yeah, showing up as white bubbly strands. Recycling vacuum bags. If you can, do. Because obviously it reduces the amount of plastic and stuff I've got to throw in the bin. It costs me less money. There's a million reasons to recycle your bag. There's also a very big reason not to recycle your bag. I'm being very careful with these in making sure that I don't get too many ridges and getting resin shards stuck in the ridges. If you get resin shards stuck in, your rid in, the, in the ridges during the debulking and the storage of your secondhand bag or your recycled bag, you can actually puncture the bag and then your bag's got a hole in it and that creates a whole world of drama for you to vacuum bag with next time. So I've been pretty careful throughout the whole process in thinking about how I'm going to try and recycle my bag uh, from the get-go with the, the way it's laid out so that I don't get too much resin coming through and up into ridges to create um, these ridges of, of resin inside of wrinkles so that I can reuse the bag. Um, just like I said before, um, <laughs> we're, we're trying to race for the planet as much as we can, but when you're making boats, there is unfortunately a massive byproduct of waste, especially if you are 
trying to use slightly more advanced techniques. And why would I be using advanced techniques? Which is glass and polyester. Well, we do want our boat light and it doesn't matter what resin system I use, the end result is the end result whether I use polyester or epoxy resin or vinyl ester resin. If you want it white, uh, light and conforming to some difficult geometry, um, then yeah, you got to use, <laughs> unfortunately, you got to use vacuum bags. Um, or you could press them instead of vac bagging them. That is actually a lot less uh, consumable intensive uh, pressing the products. I may actually be able to do that. I've got a small flat panel um, I need to make and I might have enough stuff around to actually press the panel instead of vacuum it. Now pressing a panel particularly with polyester is very very beneficial because you don't end up with all the volatile ball outs. Like you can squeeze the living bajingas out of it and you don't end up with all this micro bubbling problem. The issue with a vacuum is you create a vacuum and liquids boil at lower temperatures. So by creating a vacuum by uh, nature and physics, whichever way you want to look at it, you create a lower atmospheric pressure and the liquids that are inside of them, we call them volatiles, will boil and come out, even if it was water. If I've got in there, I've actually made, and I've shown it in demos when I was, when I was doing the R&D thing, I would actually create a vacuum bag, and we used to use it in the early days to find leaks and molds and clean molds, where I'd infuse the mold with just fresh water, and it would show up if the mold had a leak in it, create and show all the bubbles, also wash all the dust and crap out of the mold. It was really good, but we could actually boil the water in the mold um, by putting it under a vacuum and then showing people that you can boil water um, under a vacuum. It was, it was pretty cool. But to create the atmospheric clamp or the atmospheric press, we need to create a vacuum so that the atmosphere will push down on it. When we create the vacuum, well, we have all these vacuum related problems because now we've got our resins and glasses and things inside a vacuumed environment. We can actually make these panels by actually pressing them. When we press them, we don't have that vacuum environment problem. So we can actually press a part at more than one atmosphere and not end up with all of these um, volatile boil outs. And now this happens with, with epoxies as well. Don't, it's not a totally unique problem with um, polyesters, this boiling out. It's just much, much, much less uh, volatile boil out in epoxies. I was thinking about the press thing. We did use that technique to make the um, carbon strap for our... Um, yes, yeah, exactly. So our Martin Gale, Martin we used the um, yep, a pressing technique where we clamped the carbon uni between two bits of aluminium box section in that funny shape. Um, the likes companies like uh, ATL in Australia, they make big epoxy panels by clamping them in a big press. Um, yeah, there's, there's heaps and heaps of companies and uh, products and techniques that use the, the the pressing method as opposed to a vacuum method. But the issue is, is you're a little bit more limited in your geometry. So that is that is a limitation to the pressing technique. And you're not limited to flat panels with the pressing technique because uh, we use the press technique we used to make a lot of um, foils, hydrofoils for um, the kite guys. And we developed um, two piece aluminium machine molds and we'd fill them up solid with pre-preg carbon and with just enough 
We'd overfilled the mold just with the right number of prepreg layers to create uh, pressure in them. And then we'd heat it all up and press it all together and squish it all so that it would, um, when the two alum when the resin melted in the in the prepreg, the aluminium would come together and squeeze, and the excess layers of material in there would create the pressure um, to press all of those layers out hard against the tool and squeeze out any excess resin until that tool would actually come together. So you can do complicated shapes, but it costs a lot more money. Uh, the beauty with a vacuum bag is it's a bag and it'll conform to any shape you want. There you see here, recycled more, more bag. Unfortunately, can't recycle this. So let's go through the layers here. Oh, consumable. So we just took away the vacuum bag. You'll see my breather felt just came off of this part. No dramas at all. The breather felt is what we use to allow whatever air is under the bag to travel around under the bag and to our vacuum source. It also helps with the um, small amounts of excess resin. So you can see I've got a reasonable bleed out here. This is, you know, textbook bleed out. You can see we've got little dots um, all around that are approximately five-ish to 10-ish mil diameter. Okay, that is spot on what you're chasing. That means that I've got my resins wet, got a little bit of extra in there. So there's a bit to, you know, sort of move and slush around, comes through. And it also comes out with a little bit of whatever air was left in there. Also is able to sort of come up and out with it. Where the edges are, you know, obviously there's a bit more excess bleed, but that's because in this case, very specifically put extra resin in the corners to make sure that they would fill out. So these are good indications as to how your laminating went. So let's get rid of that layer. Then we have here our perforated plastic. This plastic, you can see, can you see it through there? As a piece of um, nylon plastic, and it has lots of little perforated holes in it. Let's see if uh, and normally you don't recycle this. Hmm. Yep, can't cycle that unfortunately. <laughs> all the all the little holes are filled up with resin. All plastic in the bin. So that's our perforated plastic. Now you can see where the red stripes are. That's my peel ply. I didn't peel ply this entire part. Now I'm a huge fan of peel ply surfaces everywhere, but I didn't peel ply this entire part because to be honest I don't really need it. Because what I'll be doing is giving this a very light scuff, potentially even just a um, scotch bright, and painting directly onto that. So this is uh, the Teflon table that we talked about a couple of videos ago. And you can see there's absolutely no wax on this table. No release agents, nothing. That's just the pure surface of the Teflon. Boom. There it is. Okay, pretty nice. This here is just a piece of uh, foam with some more Teflon stuck to it. Oh, this piece? Yeah, my return flange. Okay. There you go. There's my return flange. So we were talking about earlier penetrations in bulkheads and things like that and building return flanges into things. Um, so yeah, if you wanted to build a this is how you build a return flange into a, a into a bulkhead. Actually, we'll do the bulkhead down in that goes into the floor, and where the floor will sit on top. But basically, it'll be built exactly the same as this. So the bulkhead that will go into the boat. So that'll be the shape of the the boat there. Yeah, and then the return flange is built onto it. So I don't actually have to tape it. I just give this a sand, a little bit of glue. Job done. What's the next part? Uh, chop, chop all these up and... Yeah, chop all these up, get them into position, glue, glue some stuff together.